I'm here to talk to you today about your Facebook privacy and identity and also exploring uh, your digital identity. Um, how many of you have a Facebook? Raise your hand. Raise it high so I can see it. Okay, I don't even have to count because the majority of us are going to have a Facebook. This is the um, exemplar among social network services. Social network service being a uh, service online that will reproduce your offline social network in a virtual setting. And it is also uh, a service that now has users numbering over a billion that puts it um, in a comparable category to the nation of India in terms of population. So this is a global phenomenon. Uh, social networks, and particularly Facebook, are global. I studied Facebook privacy for my dissertation, and I did so because I have a uh, fascination with technology. And I am also uh, interested in science fiction and the boundary between them. I'm also interested in the banal things um, from every day uh, that we do in interacting with technology, um, using cell phones and PDAs, for instance, checking our Facebook accounts. So I spent a lot of time thinking about Facebook privacy, if I had to sort of boil it down to a few tips for graduating uh, seniors from college and also some commentary on the idea of identity online, it would be the following presentation. So uh, let's get started. First of all, we've all heard the horror stories from the headlines. So I'll give you an example from 2006 when Stacey Snyder uh, posts a picture of herself on MySpace where she's dressed like a pirate, drinking at a party and uh, with a caption that says drunken pirate underneath it. And a couple of years later, on the basis of this, she is denied a teaching degree from a Pennsylvania college. This is legal. Uh, more recently, a 16-year-old named Kimberly Swan, from, uh, who was interning at Ivel Marketing in the United Kingdom, uh, wrote on her Facebook wall uh, during her internship that it was, quote, shit, all I do is hole punch all day. And she was subsequently let go. So. We can see from these examples uh, that we are being uh, preemptively um, monitored or filtered in the words of Henley. And uh, this is a phenomenon that according to one report in the United States, 45% of employers will check our uh, social network background and then 35% of those people will then make a decision not to hire someone on the basis of what they find. So these are the stakes that we're looking at uh, as we move into the so-called real world. But the good thing to keep in mind, and maybe this will be a little bit of a comfort for you, is that we're not alone. Uh, so for instance, when the US government denounces WikiLeaks uh, in 2010, WikiLeaks responds, uh, which is an uh, international organization, responds by releasing a bunch of diplomatic cables that embarrass the US government. And according to uh, Noam Cohen in the New York Times, um, this recalls a teenage phrase, uh, TMI or too much information. That is the idea that um, what WikiLeaks and Julian Assange are attempting to do is render U.S. government uh, as brain-addled, quote-unquote, as your average teen on MySpace. So uh, keep in mind that when you think about your privacy being under fire, uh, it's also governments and institutions that are coming under fire in the age of social media. Okay. My research in my dissertation, uh, what I did was I asked, do seniors change their Facebook privacy as they approach the job market and, uh, or grad school? And if so, in what ways? And to do this, I did interviews in the Philadelphia area with 56 seniors between the ages of 21 and 24 uh, in 30 to 40 minute interviews face to face. Uh, and then I grouped them into categories um, according to level of Facebook usage, uh, casual or engaged user, and then also, uh, of course, gender, and their career track. Would they be going on into graduate school? Would they be going on into the business world? Um, and so, you know, what I found by looking at this is that naturally content management is going to vary quite a bit across uh, people's experience and their, uh, their sort of track in life. Uh, those, for example, who are going into the area of finance and also women are going to be very vigilant in how uh, they manage particularly privacy of pictures on Facebook. That was another distinction that I discovered, that uh, there was in uh, seniors' minds a difference between um, how pictures are managed, which is uh, you know, with heightened caution, versus commentary. If you're making comments or um, you know, political comments, for example, um, there's no expectation that future employers or people that you're interviewing with are necessarily going to go back and uh, read what you've written. Uh, people are going to only look very superficially um, at 
what, what you have on Facebook. And also this idea of a third person effect. That is the idea that Facebook privacy is a problem for other people, but not me necessarily. And so this was reflected in a lot of uh, what my respondents were saying. But I think the more interesting point is number two, this distinction between pictures and comments. The distinction between images and text. And so uh, the way in which people sort of monitor or police their visual regime uh, is going to be very different uh, from how they revisit, uh, revisit comments. So people are going to look at uh, pictures and their privacy with much more caution. They're going to scrutinize them, but not necessarily uh, the types of comments that are made. Or so you might think, but then looking more closely at the data, I see that even though pictures seem like the main problem from a privacy standpoint, there are all of these lingering doubts in uh, my respondents' minds regarding what are going to be the effects long term of making my political views uh, you know, visible on Facebook, uh, liking things, of leaving maybe on PC comments or jokes within small communities on Facebook. Where are all these comments going after all? And this reminded me of something, uh, a point made in a book called Delete by Victor Meyer Schoenberger in, uh, about the obsolescence of forgetting in the digital age. And so this leads me to my first point uh, regarding Facebook and identity, the idea of a chilling effect. Victor Meyer Schoenberger says that in an age where um, everything that we are putting into the internet is basically recorded in perpetuity, now more than ever, the future is having a chilling effect on what we do in the present. And so uh, one question that I might have is, if you think about your own usage, um, do you hold back a little bit? Is there an element of self-censorship that is involved uh, in your own self-presentation on Facebook and on the Facebook wall? Okay, so this is point one a chilling effect, potentially. Um, that's what goes on in the front stage of Facebook, but there's also a backstage to Facebook, and as we'll see, um, that's actually the majority of the communication that's going on. Facebook is an iceberg. According to a really excellent study uh, among college students of their Facebook usage uh, by DeBotton, Love, uh, Lovejoy, Horn, and Hughes from 2009, uh, Facebook is an iceberg, meaning that what we see in the top one-eighth of the iceberg uh, is the fun and social networking that we participate in on a regular basis. But in the bottom seven-eighths of the iceberg is also uh, a bunch of network data that we volunteer uh, for marketers to aggregate in various ways and to then uh, you know, market things to us or tailor things to us uh, on the internet and also to, um, you know, for public relations and advertising. So um, I think that this is a really uh, excellent metaphor. And um, most of the time, it's in the background. Most of the time, we don't think about it. We don't actually have much control over uh, this you know, large sum of data that we don't even think about. Every now and then, it will come into visibility. Maybe Facebook makes some sort of move. Um, whereby they try to change the interface, people protest, and then, they, and then uh, people push back, and then Facebook has to um, you know, sort of relent. Or maybe there's some sort of huge blunder, such as with the 2010 app scandal. How many of you have a Farmville account or play Farmville? Anyone? Okay. Okay. Just one person in the room. I'm sort of surprised by that. Um, well, Farmville and also... Um, uh, Mafia Wars, for instance, were actually um, trans, uh, transmitting what's referred to as a user identification number. That's a UID number, um, which is a, ve a very sensitive uh, piece of information because it can be used to potentially find uh, detailed information about the individual um, and could lead to identity theft. So these were inadvertently being transmitted uh, by apps such as Mafia Wars and Farmville. Uh, in fact, 15% of Facebook users log in every day just to use Farmville. So we're talking about tens of millions of people who potentially had their privacy um, at risk as a result of this glitch in the program. So sometimes uh, this iceberg will come into sharper focus. And according to uh, Jeff Rosen in a really excellent article in the New York Times um, from 2010 about the end of forgetting there's going to be Web 3.0 in the not too distant future where uh, aggregation of information will occur on a much larger scale. Things like social networks, facial recognition, um, blog posts, YouTube, all of this stuff will be recombined and aggregated in ways 
um, perhaps even with Google searches, or maybe uh, even social aggregators that currently exist, such as on Spokeo.com, S-P-O-K-E-O. -E if you haven't visited this site, I strongly recommend that you do because it will tell you a lot about your privacy. Um, my concern is that college seniors who are graduating and thinking uh, you know, mainly about or obsessing about detagging photos may be caught off guard completely by um, the level of integration of data that is coming. So that's my second point, uh, the Facebook iceberg. My third point, uh, what does this all say about online identity? Well, the digital self. And this, I think, uh, is really fascinating. Uh, a number of my respondents actually referred to having an awareness of a sort of digital doppelganger, a, uh, a sort of shadow identity, if you will, that is lurking them uh, on the net um, or maybe on Facebook. Or maybe uh, you are chasing after uh, your uh, shadow identity. And so um, this is interesting because it demonstrates awareness of the sort of uh, transmission of information that is taking place behind the scenes on Facebook. And uh, it's something that's referred to in critical studies of media in discussions of uh, social networks, of privacy, and also surveillance. So uh, it's you know, been referred to using terms such as uh, data subjects, individuals, uh, digital doppelganger, digital self, etc. So it's a, it's a term that already exists out there. It'll be interesting uh, to look in my research at how younger people conceive of this concept and actually demonstrate a you know, degree of uh, savvy when it comes to internet privacy. All right, so all this is wonderful. We can say, you know, Mario, uh, you can um, you know, talk all day about this from a theoretical standpoint. What is going to be in it for me? So what sorts of tips can I give you as you're approaching the job market? And, um, you know, give, uh, keeping in mind the idea that a large percentage of employers are going to be checking up us, on us on social networks, how much do you really want that job? Uh, that's a question you should ask yourself when you're posting or maybe thinking about holding back information. Um, if your uh, potential employer or the person who is interviewing you is going to be scrutinizing your wall posts, is going to be looking back over uh, what you've written, maybe making hiring or firing decisions on the basis of pictures that you've put up there, of political opinions that you have. Uh, do you really want to be working that, with that person? Do you want to be working with that person if they ask you for your login information in the actual interview, which happens. It has happened. It is, uh, it is in a legal gray area, mainly happens in the area of um, uh, finance or uh, military or go um, government hiring or police. Um, but I think that this is also questionable from a standpoint of personal integrity. Um, so that is what I would say regarding the front stage of your uh, you know, digital identity on Facebook. In terms of the backstage, in terms of the bottom half of the iceberg and the information um, you know, that you can't necessarily see, you should be aware of privacy. Uh, you should definitely set your uh, privacy settings uh, you know, to optimally reflect what you want to show to the world. And you should keep abreast of the privacy landscape online. Um, but I think also, uh, if Facebook decides to make global changes without properly consulting with us first, I think we should reserve the right to be outraged. And people in the past have protested on Facebook, uh, these types of things. That being said, um, if all of this fails, you can always go to a website such as reputation.com where you can pay to have them weight your Google score and only reflect a better um, image to the entire net, uh, internet. <laughs> all right, so um, you know, these are some tips that I would provide. Uh, I think it's also interesting to note because according to the British government recently, um, from the British government's top scientist, Internet uh, access and hyperconnectivity is actually fundamentally altering human identity. Uh, and this is due to social networks and also role-playing games. And so um, our connection to these constantly, uh, they say, is actually simultaneously unifying us as a world and fragmenting us into communities that transcend national borders and also personally as individuals uh, who have an identity that is offline and also one online where we are uh, you know, 
role playing as a dragon all of the time, for instance. So, um, so we can see that actually these technologies are fundamentally altering our conceptions of self and of identity. So in closing, I, I would actually like to make uh, known another TED Talk by Amber Case, uh, not called I am a cyborg and so can you, that's just my joke. Um, it was actually called We Are All Cyborgs Now. And uh, this is sort of like a, a TED Talk within a TED Talk, a taco within a taco uh, for South Park fans out there. So um, what Amber Case does is she begins to build off of an idea presented by Donna Haraway in the 1980s that we are uh, already cyborgs by virtue of our interaction with technology. And uh, um, I'm very grateful to Amber because she's saying uh, that, she's taking this idea one step further and saying that because we are constantly interfacing with social networks and Facebook, using personal desktop assistants and cell phones and iPhones and uploading all of this information into the cloud and keeping it there um, as a sort of augmentation of our already existing mental faculties that we are in a very real sense becoming uh, cyborgs or cybernetic organisms. So um, she calls herself a cyborg anthropologist and in some respects I align my research with this particular methodological approach. Um, and I think it's also interesting to consider how this digital doppelganger or shadow identity that we um, all intuitively uh, might perceive as being folded into a cyborg identity that interfaces with social networks. So maybe two sides of the same coin. This is something that I'm thinking about in my research as well. Uh, but I admire that TED Talk uh, quite a bit. So um, I, you know, in closing, I would just like to say that uh, while we are gaining greater intimacy with interfaces such as Facebook that allow us to access social networks, and um, you know, in a particular time, where things uh, that have previously been the stuff of science fiction, such as drones, such as, for instance, augmented reality um, Google glasses, or the idea that social networks uh, sites are fundamentally changing human conceptions of our own identity, it is, as Donna Haraway said, that the boundary between science fiction and social reality is an optical illusion. Thank you.